All right, now we're going to talk about this group called the Bruderhof, and uh, this is the smallest of the four groups. The Mennonites are the biggest, the Hutterites following them, and then the Amish, and then the Bruderhof. Bruderhof is just uh, German for brotherhood. That's all it means. And, you know, again, check out the old uh, Catholic slash Masonic term there, the brotherhood, you know, the fatherhood, the fraternity, you know. Of course, there's no, I'm sure there's no tie-ins to the, Masonic Lodge or anything like that. Yeah, right. We're going to see about that as we go into this video. But there's actually a a Franciscan monk, Father Benedict Groschel, and he has a show in New York City, and he actually is interviewing the head of the Bruderhof cult. Let's watch some of this. Good evening and welcome to Sunday Night Prime and another new program and this is a different one again. I like to have different things. This is a most unusual program. Uh, we, as you know, EWTN is a Catholic broadcast and generally we have Catholics. Once in a rare while we have Protestant people on our program, but usually with on with some Catholics, but tonight we have just Protestants. Okay, I think that's kind of funny. He says, you know, we have Protestants here tonight. No, you're just all a bunch of Catholics, okay? <laughs> uh, the the Bruderhof, they are Catholic. Uh, they're not Anabaptist. They're not some kind of Bible-believing Christians or something. They're Catholics, and we're going to see as we continue that they, he actually just basically comes right out and says it. The Protestant Reformation is all about people that protest certain abuses of Catholicism, but they don't want to abolish Catholicism, they just want to reform it, remold it. And I can tell you right now, anybody that meets in church buildings is a Protestant. Okay? Why? Because Catholicism, were, they were the very first ones to take the ancient pagan temples, like of Diana and Artemis and all these other pagan temples from the Greeks, and they Christianized it, and then they worship in them things. So if you have any kind of a temple like that, if you're meeting in a church building anywhere, you are a Protestant. You are reforming what Catholicism originally did. All right? You won't find any teaching in Scripture that says, build a church building as a Christian in the New Testament. You're not going to find it. All right? So... We're going to watch this video here, and you aren't going to believe some of the stuff. I mean, they just come openly right out and say that the Bruderhof is, they're like monastic Catholics. Let's watch. And we have representatives tonight from the Bruderhof. Very, very interesting people. And uh, I'll tell you this, very, uh, very Protestant background. And here are books, and some of their books have introductions by the Pope. Figure that one out. Cardinal Ratzinger. <coughs> so. I think that's kind of funny, you know. Some of their books have introductions by the Pope. Figure that one out. <laughs> it's like we very easily can if you're a Bible-believing Christian. You can look and you can say, yeah, because the Bruder Hoff are Catholics. This communistic meeting in, in this commune thing and you're all giving up this and taking vows of poverty and all this other stuff and we're going to see that later. They actually do take a vow of poverty. I'm not just joking about that. All this stuff is Catholic. That's why the Pope is endorsing the books of this Bruderhof guy. Let's continue. So, this evening I want to welcome my good friend Pastor Christoph and his wife Verena Arnold. And uh, Christoph's grandfather, Eberhard Arnold, began this movement called the Brotherhood. Uh, right, Father Benedict. That was about 90 years ago, after World War I. My grandfather was a Lutheran pastor, and he left the Lutheran church because he wanted to be more faithful to the Sermon on the Mount and to be a true Anabaptist and lead community life actually like the Catholic monastic orders and the Anabaptists. Whew. Did you get that? Did you get that one? It was started, the Bruderhof was started 
90 years ago, which I'm not sure exactly when this program was done, but it's not even probably not even 100 years old, maybe a, right around that time. But it was a Lutheran. Lutherans are Catholics. You know, if you haven't seen my wife's testimony on that, you know, you can. And of course, the Lutherans now have openly signed up with Catholicism that they're they're back under Catholicism. Never really left it. They just reformed it. You know. But he starts out. He's Lutheran. But he wants to return to the, te the true teachings of the Sermon on the Mount. All unsaved liberals will talk about the Sermon on the Mount. They love it because there's no mention of the blood of Jesus Christ in it. It's all do good and things like this. It's the, Jesus Christ was giving the rules that would be there for the kingdom, the millennial kingdom that would come when Satan is bound and in the bottomless pit. But you're never going to live that way. The Sermon on the Mount, you cannot live that today with what's going on in the world. Not possible. It's only possible when Jesus Christ is physically ruling and reigning on the earth. All right. So anybody that's saying the Sermon on the Mount for today, the Sermon on the Mount for today, they are a lying false prophet. Mark it down. Okay. So he's going to, to, to live, you know, the, wants to live the Sermon on the Mount, and, and he says, we also took some things from Catholic monastic orders, like living like monks and nuns. Let's continue. Uh, the buildings are often attached too, aren't they? Yeah. So you're kind of living in a married monastery. Correct. Put that together. It's a good comparison. Very, very good comparison. And isn't it that community counts? You know, man is a communal being. We really need one another. And for a person to really become whole, he has to be able to relate to everyone he comes into contact with. So this Franciscan monk says, you know, that your homes, you know, they're in your commune, they're connected to each other. And so, you know, you have to get along with everybody else and things like And this is the Bible system? No, it's not the Bible system. All right, we're supposed to, a man is supposed to have his own home and he's supposed to provide for his wife Okay, and you're not supposed to be connected all together. I mean, this, this is wickedness here. And man is not a communal being. That is nonsense. And we have to be able to relate to everybody we meet and things like that. Well, I agree in the sense of having to witness to people. I think that if the Lord gives you an opportunity to witness, go ahead, take it. Sometimes those doors aren't open. Sometimes you'll try to get into witnessing opportunity and somebody you work with or some guy at the store or wherever, and it's just you can't get an opening there. There's no door of utterance, as the Bible calls it. You know, but to say we have to, to kind of get along with everybody else and things like that stuff's nonsense. All right, but let's continue. I mean, I, I'm not sure about others in <clears throat> America, but we, we are about between three to 4,000 people now. Uh -huh. And right in the New York area. Mostly have. in New York, but also in Pennsylvania. And one of the signs is that the ladies wear, wear, wear a, a kerchief. And uh, I was coming throughout the Midwest someplace, and there were several, several people very plainly dressed, and the women were wearing uh, the Head kerchief. Covering. And I went up and spoke to them, and they were not actually members of your group, but they were related to your group. Yes. They, they know each other. Yes, of course, they are the Amish, which in oh, their yes. closing are very similar, similar uh, yes. to our brothers and sisters. The, the Amish and yeah. the, the Mennonites. Yeah, the Mennonites, and, yes. yes. So it's a, a little piece of living history, history. right yes. here in New York City. Yes. Don't, don't be surprised. Yeah. I think it's funny, you know, you, you see these women that wear the head coverings and, and oftentimes, uh, for, again, from personal experience I've seen this, they will run the man. We're going to be talking more about that in the future. My wife and I are going to be doing a, a video together on the thing of head coverings. What does the Bible actually teach in 1 Corinthians chapter 11? But this thing of, you know, he's like, oh, you got a handkerchief on your head. And she's like, head covering. You know, just like, it's a head covering. How dare you? You know, and they really do count on it for their salvation. I've seen that. And it's so funny because the Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is talking about, and, and the first part of it, it's talking about the spiritual covering of a man covering his wife, being there to protect his wife. And it's ironic because, and in the, in the latter part of, latter part of the, the 
passage there on the head covering thing that whatever it's actually talking about her hair given her for a covering and Paul's saying there's no there's no command given here that you have to wear some kind of a cloth covering so the whole the the actual scriptures debunk this thing of wearing these cloth head coverings but it's ironic because the women that I've seen that wear a head covering it's almost like it's literally covering up their uh, spiritual requirement to have their husband be their spiritual head and they'll, they'll be very very feministic and very controlling and domineering I've seen that thing I know Michael Pearl has a real good video on that uh, the thing of should women wear head coverings and stuff very interesting but you just saw he just mentioned he said we're very similar to the Amish and Mennonites right there it is and they are by the way too but let's continue what is something important for us it is the Brotherhood has pro, uh, published a number of books by yourself, Johann Christoph Arnold, with a foreword by oh, Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa. Yeah. It has it like this, Maria. And uh, it is, here's the blurb of the book. I'm very happy for this book and its moral conviction. It is inevitably arouse hatred, but it must continue to, in trying to overcome evil with good. Pope Benedict the, the 16th. 16th. Correct. Now, how would you like that? Yeah. You've got the Pope giving you a blurb. Yeah. <laughs> I never got a blurb from the Pope. <laughs> and a number of uh, interesting people here on the back. I'm one of them. But uh, Dr. Von Hildebrand, who's been in our program. Dr. Paul Witz, who's mm -hmm. been on our program. And here is Cardinal Arinze uh, from the Vatican uh, yes. on the book. And uh, sex... God and marriage. Now, why are all those Catholics, including the Pope and Mother Teresa, why are they recommending a book by a uh, Anabaptist? Why? Because they're not Anabaptists; they're Catholics. You know, Pope Benedict, you know, got in trouble a number of years ago because he came out and publicly made the statement. He said, "The Catholic Church is the only church that there is salvation in." It's the only way to heaven, which is official Catholic doctrine. I mean, that's in their catechism. So why then would he promote a book by separatist Anabaptists? Because they're not. They're Catholic. Crazy. But let's continue. Crazy. And if I may say this, there was a certain amount of uh, apologetics to uh, pagans. You know, there were some decent good pagans years ago, like Aristotle <laughs> and Plato and those people. You know, he's got to just take a minute to apologize to pagans. You know, I don't want to offend pagans, you know, because there were some good ones like Aristotle and Plato, you know, both of which hated God, you know. They were good pagans, you know. And again, and again understanding what Catholicism is. Catholicism is taking pagan practices and pagan, wa pagan ways and combining it and giving it Christian titles and Christian sounding things like that. Roman Catholicism is, you go back to the book of Daniel, you have this image, this, this statue of gold. And the, the final kingdom is the uh, part iron, part clay. That is Roman Catholicism. And I, and I believe and teach that that kingdom has been around since the Roman Catholic Church was established. The Roman Empire fell. The two legs, the two legs of iron, the eastern and the western kingdoms of Rome, they fell and they merged into the Roman Catholic Church. And they've been in control of the world off and on ever since then. And they do a lot of things behind the scenes. So you can say, don't say, well, the Catholic Church isn't really that powerful. The Vatican really doesn't have much you know, sway in things. Oh, yeah, they do. Oh, yeah, they do. Especially through the Jesuit order and some of that other stuff. But let's continue. But our belief is very much like the monastic orders, like the Benedictine orders and, and many, many others. Actually, we, we have drawn great strengths out of the Catholic monastic orders and feel very much akin in many, many areas with them. There it is. There it is. What more do you need to hear? I mean, 
we have drawn a lot of strength from the, I mean, we're very much like the Benedictine monks, and, and we've drawn a lot of strength from the Catholic monastic orders. And earlier he said, yeah, we're just like the Mennonites and the Amish. I mean, right there. And this guy is not just some Bruderhof dude that's, you know, just kind of come out of it or whatever, and he's a secret cat. He's the head of the cult. Three to four thousand strong when this video was made. And he is openly saying, we are like a Catholic monastic order. But let's continue. Now you're going to hear from the guy's son. Let's listen to this. And again, listen for the old Sermon on the Mount thing. Listen to this. My <clears throat> parents joined the community as it was moving through England in the early 40s and then down to Paraguay where they married. That's where I was born when the community was down there. And then moved up to the States in the early 60s and lived in the community there. And again, what was your view of what was the community doing? The community was <clears throat> trying to live out the Sermon on the Mount and, and fled from Hitler and then had to leave England, came to Paraguay and then up to the States in the pursuit of living out truly the gospel and the commands of Jesus that are laid out so clearly for us in the Sermon on the Mount. And that simply is the purpose of the Brotherhood. Exactly. To live out the gospel. Uh-huh. Yeah, we live out the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah, sure. Sure you do. Sure you do. You know, uh, what, what these thieves, these lying thieves are trying to do is they're trying to say, we can have the kingdom without Jesus Christ. We'll just say he's here among us and in our beliefs. Or if you're a true papist, then you say, you know, the Pope is Jesus Christ. He's the faithful replacement substitute son of God. You know, vicarious Philly D. You know, you can... There's different interpretations of that in, in Latin, but it's basically saying the substitute, you know, for God, essentially, is what the whole thing is. And, you know, that's what the Catholics do. That's what the Bruderhof does. That's what the Amish do. That's what a lot of these cults do. They literally are believing that they can have peace on earth. That's why they're post-millennial many times. You know, they'll say, you know, well, we're going to bring in the kingdom. We're going to ha have the kingdom come. And then Jesus Christ, you know, he'll come back at the end of it. You know. And I talked to this Amishman, this Joseph Yoder guy, or, or Jonas Yoder, excuse me. And, you know, it was, it was all this, the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom. Um, let me just show you a verse real quick here. You can look this up in your Bible if you have a King James Bible. I don't know what the new ones would say. You know, these new ones are from the Vatican. Anything but a King James Bible for modern Christians, you know, I mean, I, I know you can go back to the Geneva, and the Geneva has a few issues to it, which is why I don't use it. But um, the New King James, the NIV, the New American Standard Version, the ESV, any of that junk, it comes from the Vatican. Documented fact, you can watch my documentary, The Real Bible Version Issue Exposed, if you want more on that. But uh, Matthew chapter 11 and verse 12, it says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. You say, but that doesn't make sense, because the Bruderhof are pacifist. Yeah, okay, the Catholics, they have their armies and things like that. I mean, you can watch any kind of thing where you have a, a big thing there at St. Peter's Basilica. They'll have armed guards, you know, fully automatic rifles standing there. You know, so, yeah, it's, it's a military order. It's a, it's a political power, the Vatican. But you say the Bruderhof isn't. We're going to see about that in a later video. Uh, the, this head of the Bruderhof cult thing, you know, is actually, you know, gets a concealed carry permit for a 44 Magnum. You know, it's kind of funny. But uh, the fact of the matter is, if you want to bring in a kingdom right now, and actually, if you want to bring in the kingdom, it's going to be by violence. The kingdom of heaven in your King James Bible is a reference to the physical kingdom, the whole world being controlled from Jerusalem, the city of the great king. It's in Matthew chapter 5. Neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. You know, you can't take the kingdom without doing it by force. And you say, well, Jesus will come back and he's the prince of peace. He's the prince of peace after he kills the Antichrist's army. 200 million man army and cast the Antichrist and the false prophet down into the lake of fire. So yes, Jesus is going to take it by force.
And we, his saints, are also going to be there, you know, taking people to judgment. It's going to be fun. And if these guys, if these dumb nuts make it through the time of Jacob's trouble, if they don't ever get saved and they don't get out of it, and then they get through the time of Jacob's trouble, we're going to be hunting them down and taking them to Jerusalem to be judged by the king. If they're trusting in their Bruderhof ways and whatever else, they ain't going to be making it into the kingdom. Guarantee it. But let's watch the next clip. And we had, Paul and I had the joy of traveling with Stephen MacDonald to first the Belfast Island to talk about forgiveness to the Catholics and the Protestants. And then we traveled to Israel to talk to the Palestinians and the Jews and forgive. In Israel, they do not word, want to hear that word forgive. It's like an F word. They don't want to hear that, uh, that anyone advocating for, for forgiveness uh, they do not like it, but it's a very, very needed message. <laughs> Again, it's like <laughs> right there. I mean, what is the Antichrist going to do? He is going to bring that reconciliation between Protestants and Catholics. He's also going to bring peace between the Palestinians and the Jews. Sign a peace treaty. It's a very needed message. Yeah, that's why your Antichrist is coming. You're going to just love him and fall down and worship him. Continuing. And it is these people that we are trying to encourage, isn't it, Paul? Absolutely. And this is also then comes back to the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, Blessed are those who are peacemakers. Yes. And truly this yes. is... What is the call of all of us to be a peacemaker, whether it's with my wife, in my family, or in a larger community? And that is so important. Blessed are the peacemakers that, you know, give up Bible standards and don't carry around King James Bibles and, and say, hey, you're wrong for this and you're wrong for that. Let me show you the truth. That's not being a peacemaker according to this nonsense here. Being a peacemaker according to these weirdos is dropping all your differences and not standing for absolute truth. Even though the Bible plainly teaches that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus says in John chapter 14 verse 6, there is no other way to heaven than Jesus Christ. We can't reconcile with Catholics. They teach that salvation is through eating Jesus Christ. Okay, Even though Jesus, in the same passage there, where it's talking about eating my flesh and drinking my blood, he says, the flesh profiteth nothing, it's the spirit that quickeneth. You know? So, and, and, you know, he's, and I, as I said in my, my video, 13 reasons why every Christian must reject the Mass, Jesus Christ is physically present. I mean, if his flesh and blood, and that's what they teach the, the host and the wine becomes, if it can save you, then go up and take a bite out of Jesus when he was here on the earth. You know, and he did the Last Supper before he died on the cross. If the Last Supper is salvation, why die on the cross? It's kind of a dumb thing to do. And why all this talk about faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ? <laughs> you know, if, if you can earn your way or if you can eat your way to heaven. That makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? But let's watch one other clip here, and then we're going to go on to another subject here with the Bruderhof. I'm actually going to show you videos from their YouTube channel. Let's continue. And I hope that you will give our best to the members of the Brotherhood, the Bruderhof, and I'm glad that they were able to come on our program. Here's the most Protestant Protestants <laughs> and the most Catholic Catholics yes. that you can find. Yeah, and we're nice. getting along. Absolutely. Right yeah. For a few hundred years. We have worked together for years, for Father years. Benedict, and years we, years. we've always gotten along together. <laughs> yes, and I'm so grateful that you could come tonight. Yeah, you know, we're the most Protestant, you're the most Protestant of the Protestants, and we're the most Catholic of the Catholics. Well, praise the Lord, I'm not in either group. I'm not a Protestant. I protest the Catholic system, the Catholic whore, but I don't seek to reform it. Okay, I seek to get people out of that system because God's wrath and judgment is coming upon it in Revelation chapter 17 and 18. All right, The destruction of Mystery Babylon, which is Roman Catholicism. Her collars are purple and scarlet. Hello, you know, look at the big processional of bishops and cardinals and all that junk. The, purples, or the collars are purple and scarlet. And of course, you know, she reigns over the kings of the earth and, and all this other stuff. You know, she's a city that sits on seven hills. It's the Vatican. 
You know, people say it's the United States. Mystery Babylon is the United States. Does the United States sit on seven mountains? No. Is the United States a city? No. Are the United States, the, the colors of the United States, uh, purple and scarlet? No. You know, three cheers for the red, white, and blue, you know? And I, you know, believe me, I understand, you, you know, America's a very wicked nation right now, but it's not Mystery Babylon. You know, anybody that says that, that America's a mystery is Mystery Babylon, false prophet. Or they've been deceived into listening to a false prophet. So, but just crazy, you know, we get along just fine, you know, the Catholics and the Protestants, we get along just fine. <laughs> you know, and it, let me show you a verse real quick here in, Re in Revelation chapter 17. I'm trying to get these videos done fairly quickly and then actually get into more detailed sermons and other videos here. But because uh, I just want to show you, you know, people, the hardcore evidence, and then we'll talk about the scriptures. And, and But, you know, I, I do need to read this one verse here. Um, let's see, where are we at here? Revelation chapter 17. Yeah, verse 5. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Okay? She's a mother. It isn't just her. Catholicism has many daughters. They're called Protestants. They're called uh, Muslims. We like to call them Muslims. You know, they're called uh, Buddhists. They're called all these different cults out there. The Hindus, the atheism. Atheism goes back to Catholicism. You know, some of the uh, leading atheistic philosophers like Karl Marx and some of these guys, they were, you know, very friendly with Catholicism. So, you know, again, it's it, the Jesuits, their ploy is to bring all people back under the control of the Roman Catholic Church. And so they start all kinds of movements and all kinds of daughters, you know, daughters of the harlot, and they slowly start to draw you back to Rome. And that's exactly what's going on. That's why a real Bible-believing ministry, a real, truly saved Christian ministry, will be very, very much opposed to the Vatican and the Protestants and all the other daughters of the harlot. Okay, so if you if you ever listen to a ministry out there, and there are a lot of ministries out there, I can't say I recommend such and such and such, all these different guys. You know, you just have to kind of wade through that, that thing yourself. Uh, I will say Chick Publications put it, puts out some really good information, and they're called Catholic Hate Group and stuff. When you hear that, uh, there's a pretty good chance that you can listen to that group. But when you hear them covering up for the Vatican and things like that, oh, I'd be real careful. I'd be real careful. But let's watch an actual video from the Bruderhof YouTube channel. And again, remember the Hutterite thing that they give up, they don't have any you know, income and whatever else? Watch this except for just a few dollars, you know, to buy some things. Watch. No, we have no payment whatsoever. We live totally um, without money, which is wonderful. But we have everything we need and more, actually. Not in the sense of a salary or any form of money or anything like that. Uh, we make a vow of poverty and that is one of our vows, and that includes absolutely turning in everything that we own. Okay, let me stop right there. Another classic thing that cults will do, they will say, you come here and you give us all of your money. All of your possessions come to the group. That's what Vissarion, the demented Russian Antichrist, you can see my study on that. This Vissarion guy over in Siberia, he does the same thing. If you want to come and be part of their community, you know, their faith-based community. You go over there and worship him like he's Jesus Christ. You give up everything, and he gets it all. And he lives up on the mansion, cruises around on an ATV, and all of his little vegan followers are living down in the valley in huts, you know. And he's got satellite internet and all this other good stuff up there, you know. What a bunch of nonsense. But you know, we take a vow of poverty. We're going to see later who else takes a vow of poverty. But let's continue. No, everything I do is uh, voluntary, and you know I, I do it out of the joy and delight of my soul. Some some days aren't aren't quite like that, but um, you know we've we've promised to give everything um, to to the church and and everything that we earn or um, inherit. Okay. 
<laughs> I mean, just stop there. I mean, just feel the joy coming out of this guy. I mean, everything I do is voluntary. I'm not forced to do anything, and I'm happy to do it. I'm just so happy to be here. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I mean, you just feel you're so happy. You know, I mean, it's ridiculous. But, you know, it's funny because it's like, you know, you, you get in the military. My wife tells me stories about when she was in the military, and it's like the, the famous statement, you are voluntold, you know, well, we're, you're going to have mandatory fun, you know, and all this stuff like this. You know, yeah, uh-huh. Uh, I remember I was went for a job interview this one time at this woodworking factory, and they were talking about they work like 60-hour weeks, and I was like, you know, is, is it required to do the overtime? And he said, well, it's not required, but it's very strongly suggested. <laughs> I thought, just say it's required. I mean, come on. But, you know, this, it's everything we do here is voluntary. Mm -hmm. Now watch watch the joy on this uh, homemaker here. Watch 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 how she says that she's very happy. Takes a big old pause. I'm very happy here. You know, watch this. They, these are people that are under mind control. Okay, these are people that are that are have lost their rights. They've lost their individuality. They're just slaves, total slaves. And this is these are the best ones that they could find for the video. Keep that in mind. I mean, watch this. I got paid for the work I do, but it's not with a paycheck or in my bank account. Um, first of all, I got paid by having a very fulfilled and happy life. I don't get paid. <laughs> I, I, I got a very fulfilling and happy life <laughs> you know, I'm convinced I mean I'm totally sold on the thing I'm joined I'm leaving my wife and I are gonna just get rid of everything we're gonna take all of our money and we're gonna move into this cult <laughs> brotherhood I mean sure we are <laughs> yeah let's continue I don't get paid for what I do um, however if I need anything food clothing housing to get somewhere the church makes sure it happens and likewise whether I'm working at a skilled job or cleaning working in a kitchen the work is of the same worth and nobody's valued by what they do no we don't have any pay we don't have any private property we don't have any bank account we're free of the rat race believe me it's a big burden off your back to not have to worry about money this is a great freedom i would wish it for everybody oh yeah um a lot of you out there are from countries that uh, were communistic some of you have lived through communism and you can attest that these people are lying right to your face they're lying i mean just come on come on Everything that we want is provided for. I don't think so. I, I mean, give me a break. You mean to tell me that they never say no? Especially if you're, uh, you know, rocking the boat or asking too many questions, you know? Give me a break. That stuff is held over you. This is a cult. Insane. But now let's watch this thing about uh, the thing of, uh, see what the title of it is here. Do you have to pay to join? Okay, let's watch this video here with the Bruderhof. Here we go. Well, you don't have to pay money, but you do have to pay, you do have to give up pretty much everything to follow Jesus and to be part of the community. But it's a joyful giving up, as I said, uh, life without the rat race, and without having to constantly worry about money is a great burden lifted off of your back. And it's a great freedom to follow what's important, which is the spiritual side of life. Um, so that's what I would tell you. Let <laughs> me just pause for a minute. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great burden, you know, lifted off of your back. You know, you don't have to worry about that thing there anymore, you know. You don't have to worry about that nasty old wallet filled with money. Oh, no. You know. And again, 
please show me in any dispensation, show me where this teaching is. You know, this thing, this thing of, of you can just, you know, we just take care of everything. They take away your money and you don't have to worry about money and you just, you just do whatever you're told and you don't even have to worry about an income and whatever. This stuff isn't scriptural. But let's continue. Well, if you, if you choose to join, you dedicate your whole life to serving the church and those around you, and you also have to be willing to do whatever you're asked. So in a sense, you know, you don't pay anything, but, you know, the rest of your life, you know, will be used to serve others however you're asked. Like Jesus said in the parable about the man who found a treasure hidden in a field, and for sheer joy he sold everything he had, to buy that field so we could have the treasure. And uh, in fact, we hope that if a wealthy person does come to the community, that first they sell all their possessions and give the money to the poor and then come and join us. You definitely need to deal with all your worldly attachments, be it debts, be it a large bank account, before you join. But the church doesn't expect any member to bring anything with them just that you don't have any obligations either through having a lot of money or being in debt when you do come and join. Again, I got to pause it. Um, they, they say, you know, you have to take care of your debts. We can't have you coming here to the Bruder Horf, uh, Br excuse me, Bruder Hof, I was thinking Bruder Hor. <laughs> same thing. Um, one of the whores of the, the mother harlot, uh, the Vatican. But, um, you know, you have to take care of your debts. And in the last one, they said, we take a vow of poverty. Remember that here in just a couple minutes. It's going to be important. Joining our communities is and should be a sign that you've given up everything to follow Christ, to live by the heart and soul of the Bible. Okay, so again... This Jesuitical thing of, you know, following Christ means this horrible life of suffering and just putting yourself down and trying to earn your salvation and die as long as you die in a state of grace. Sure, yeah. But now let's watch another religious order that thinks very much like the Bruderhof. Hey, can I borrow 20 bucks? Why? Because I need 20 bucks. My sources say no. <laughs> so okay, here's the question. Can you enter the Jesuits if you have a ton of credit card debt or student loans? Yeah, things have changed since the 1500s, Iggy. People have loans, trust me. The important thing is whether it's personal debt or student loans. So, for instance, I put myself through school and have a BA in communication. <laughs> I maxed out my credit card, buying apps on iTunes. <laughs> now, seriously though, there are tons of reasons why people have personal and educational debt. We get that. Personal debt's going to include things like credit card debt, uh, car payments, and mortgages. And we generally want you to sort that type of stuff out before you enter. So there you see it again. This thing of, you know, we, we generally want you to take care of your debts before you come and join. And my wife just reminded me that uh, actually that's what the military does too. And if you have debt, you're like scrutinized and raked over the coals and everything else. Hmm. But I thought the Bruderhof and the uh, Amish and the Mennonites, well, ma mainly the Bruderhof and the, and the Amish and the Hutterites, because most Mennonites don't live in little communes, you know. Um, but, you know, I thought these guys were not for military types of things, pacifists and stuff like this. Why are they following military models? Why are they following the Jesuits, which the Jesuits are the military branch of the Vatican? What's going on? Hmm. Let's continue watching. Hey, Mom. Hey, Dad. I was thinking, if I become a Jesuit, do you think you'd be willing to pay off my credit card debt? Educational debt is a whole different story because it's a necessary part of getting your degree. Especially if you went to a Jesuit college. Good Lord. Also, sorry about that. But you can get your payments deferred while in the novitiate. Otherwise, we'll take over the monthly payments. When you pronounce first vows, the Jesuits will take it from there. Because you just took a vow of poverty. You ain't making any payments. Trust me. Your allowance in the 8th grade was bigger. 
you just took a vow of poverty. You know, your allowance in the eighth grade was bigger. Uh, isn't that what the Bruderhoff just said? You took a vow of poverty? Isn't that what a lot of the Amish do? They take a vow of poverty? Well, they might not take a vow of poverty, I should say, but they'll take a vow of, of obedience to the church and things like this. And they live a very poor life, a very monastic life. Strange, isn't it? But if you happen to leave the novitiate, the unpaid debt is all back on you. So you got to ask yourself, what kind of debt do I have? How and why did I end up with debt in the first place? Am I paying as much as I can on that debt? How long have I been working to pay off this debt? These questions are basically about your time and your freedom, because you're going to need a whole lot of both to make a good, honest discernment about joining the Jesuits. Look, I know it can seem like a pain waiting to enter the novitiate while paying off your debt, but freedom to discern deepens if you give it a bit more time. Okay, that's enough of that nonsense. <laughs> you know, but again, you see the Jesuits openly have a lot of the same practices and beliefs as the Bruderhof. Interesting. Now we're going to watch a little bit of a video here where an actual uh, cardinal, Catholic cardinal, goes and visits the Bruderhof community. And they get along just fine. They're wonderful friends. Let's watch this. On August 15, 2012, the Bruderhof community in Rifton, New York, was honored to welcome a good friend, Cardinal Timothy Dolan. During a luncheon and communal gathering, the discussion centered on the importance of encouraging each other, nurturing children, being joyful Christians, standing in solidarity, and working together. And you all give me such credibility because the, one of the, one of the uh, tools that our enemies have is to reduce things to a Catholic issue. Yeah. Whether it be pro-life, whether it be pro-marriage, whether it be defense of religious so, freedom, they will say it's those damn Catholics trying to impose their views on everybody. It's a human and, issue. And when, you, when, when they'll say, uh, well, I'll show you some people that aren't Catholics that believe even more passionately than we do, you know, that's a powerful yeah. thing. It was a survival of mankind. Sure it is. We stick together. Yeah. yeah. It, these, are, these, are his, these are issues of natural law and, and human reason. And, and that is why there's this beauty in welcoming children uh, yeah. in the name of Jesus. Yes. Because they are that bring us the love of Jesus and, you the, are and, right. and the hope of Jesus. You are right. So, Brother Timothy, if, if you could say a little blessing for our beloved uh, Asia, what's her second name? Maria, Maria uh, Swinger. You bet. Yeah, you bet. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, that happened a lot back with Anabaptists, like, you know, the real ones, like, you know, the Huguenots and the, that were hunted down in France and slaughtered by the Vatican, and uh, the Waldensians. You know, they were hunted down and slaughtered by the Vatican and the Vaudois and the, the Paulicians and the Donatists and all the other groups that uh, were real Anabaptists. Uh, yeah, they, they got along real good with, you know, Catholic cardinals and they sat down together and the Catholic cardinals said, I, I just think you guys are wonderful. Sure, let's continue. Now, it would mean a lot to us, uh, uh, Brother Timothy, if you could have a few words for our community, what you feel is important to us Christians here in this country in a time of real confusion where the witness of Jesus really needs to be proclaimed like never before and how we can do that together. You bet, Pastor Arnold, and, and your, your uh, beloved wife and Art and my brothers and sisters all in Christ. Thank you. Thank you for your, your gracious welcome. Thank you for your ever warm hospitality. I feel very much at home here. I hope it's evident. Uh, you make me feel at home. And I love you all very much. And I deeply appreciate the support, the prayer, and the encouragement that, that you give. Those of us who are a little older rejoice in this day because it wasn't long ago that even within the Christian family, we were at odds and we didn't savor one another's company. 
and we didn't work together, and we spent more time criticizing one another than in working together. And thanks be to the grace and mercy of Jesus, uh, those days are mostly behind us. There's still a lot of work to do. And that's crystallized here when you welcome me here, as you have in the past, and as please God, you will very often uh, in the future. I Just a couple things. First of all, we need to stay together more than ever because our enemies do, don't they? Our enemies are united. Satan, Satan is a tremendously effective general. Uh, Satan is one of the shrewdest leaders ever, and Satan is extraordinarily powerful. There's only one more powerful and effective than him, and that's Jesus. And unless the followers of Jesus stay together, we're going to go down together because Satan has organized our enemies. Uh, so we, we need to stay together. Pope John Paul II had that beautiful word, solidarity, remember? He made it a household word, solidarity. solidarity. We're together. We're not in this alone. And so we need one another. And that's the first thing I would thank you for and encourage you to, the solidarity that we need. Number two, everybody, believe it or not, we welcome opposition. And the more that people harass us, the more that people ridicule us, the more that people disdain us, the more that people attack us, the more we say we're on the right track. Because Jesus said, um, woe to you when people speak well of you. Blessed are you when they persecute you, because they did that to the prophets. And I don't know about you, but I take a deep breath every morning I open up the newspaper, because I know odds are there's going to be an attack in there, okay? Will that get us down? Does it make us angry? Does it make us bitter? No. We smile, and we ask God for grace and strength because we know that's a vindication that we're on the right track. I gotta pause it right there. Is it like, can't handle much more of this nonsense. I'm playing this just so you can see. This is prophecy being fulfilled. If you're lost and you're watching this video, this is Bible prophecy being fulfilled, okay? King James Bible is being verified by these events. All the religions coming together, Mystery Babylon pulling her daughters back to her brothel, so to speak. But, you know, Oh, we rejoice when we're attacked in the newspapers. Oh, you mean like when uh, they're coming out and saying that you're raping children and you're having to pay out all this money and you're moving pedophile priests around? So we rejoice in that. Yeah, I bet he does. I bet he does. He's probably going to do some weird things with that little baby he's holding there, too. Wouldn't surprise me a bit. All right, but let's continue. And number three, everybody, let's be people of joy. The world paints us as crabs. The world paints us as mean-spirited. The world paints us as bigots. The world paints us as, as, as people of prejudice and hate and violence. We know better. We look at what is best in the human person. We look at what raises people up. When, when, when we look at human life, when we look at creation, when we look at society and culture, we say yes, not no, because we love life and we love everything that's decent and good and virtuous in life. So we can't allow them to caricature us as mean, negative uh, crabs. We're people of joy and hope. We're people of joy and hope. And eventually, people will say, I want to be happy too. So... My brothers and sisters here in the Bruderhof community, we have to be people of joy. We, we got we to gotta break their caricature. And we have to say, you want to have fun? You come to the Bruderhof. You want to have a co good time? You come to the Catholic Church. Because we're people of life, not death. We're people of light, not darkness. We're people of giving, not getting. We're people of joy and not meanness. And if we can do that, we'll convert the world. Thanks. Thanks, Pastor Arnold. All right. Thank you so much for these encouraging words. And I hope for you young people here, it's really an encouragement that you with us together, like the Apostle Paul says, that we take on the arm of, of God to fight against the darts of Satan that, that come at us from all sides.
Pretty disgusting, isn't it? Uh, just terrible. You know, and, and uh, all, the Catholic Church has been caricatured as being hateful and things. Oh, yeah, just killing, you know, millions of Christians down through the years and, and uh, bringing in the Dark Ages and, and all the other things and, and still murdering people all over the world. You know, just disgusting. But it, to close out the video here, and I'm just going to play this video and then that'll be the end. It'll go to the salvation message. But to, to close out the video, I found an old local news report on the Bruderhof cult. You're going to see the, the head of the thing, this guy right there. You probably can't see it too good in the thing, but the, this Arnold guy, is Pastor Arnold, um, you're going to see him as a younger man. And there's a lot of controversy surrounding people left the Bruderhof, and it's just this cult-like shunning, excommunication, just like the Amish do. Um, but the Bruderhof takes it to the, to the next level. They're wiretapping people's phones. I mean, it's like an intelligence agency with harassment, death threats against former members, calling them up on the phone, threatening them, you know, trying to kill them and stuff like this. And the guy knows about it. This Arnold guy, he knows about it. He's like, oh, I didn't condone it, but, you know, it's like you can kind of understand it and whatever. Very, very dangerous organization, this Bruderhof thing. And again, I need to, I didn't even know what this was. I never even heard of the Bruderhof until we did this study. I had heard a little bit about, a little bit about the Hutterites, um, of course, the Amish and Mennonites, I knew plenty about that, being from Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. But the Bruderhof, I never even heard of this thing. So if you hear about this Bruderhof uh, cult, uh, these people are lost. Very, very, very lost. Very, very wicked. Okay, so we're going to watch this um, video here at the end. You're going to see some really crazy stuff. And that's going to be it. It's going to go into the salvation message. And i uh, going to be doing an upcoming book review of this book written by Amish. Beware of spiritual arrogance. And uh, you're going to see actually the people who wrote it are spiritually arrogant. But uh, that will be it for this video. Please watch the rest of it here. It's some really amazing information. And then watch the salvation message if you don't know for sure where you're going to go when you die. So that will be it. Thank you for watching. And uh, watch the rest of the video. You aren't going to believe some of this information. You're watching Chronicle, New England's only nightly news magazine. A pacifist Christian community with a need for a 44 Magnum. It's the kind of weapon that Dirty Harry used in the Middle East. They believe in brotherly love, but they're accused of wiretapping and harassment. Ultimately, I did receive uh, a total of three death threats. The Bruderhof, a spiritual mission with a corporate jet and some very un-American values. Do you believe in democracy? No. It's absolutely unconscionable not to let a father know that his daughter's dying of cancer. Charges of family ties torn apart or bound too tightly, all in the name of the Lord. Oh, Satan, he, he's a wicked guy. He's at work all the time. The Bruderhof, doing God's work next. Tonight, Peter Mahegan, Mary Richardson, with Liz Bruner and Mike Barnacle. Chronicle, New England's nightly news magazine. The Hatterian Brethren East. Chronicle first visited the Hatterians, or Bruderhof, a few years back. What we saw was a well-ordered Christian community, a life of devotion played out in the daily routines of work and worship, serenity and song. But there have been some discordant notes lately. Ex-members of the community have since come forward with allegations of a different side to life inside the Bruderhof. They tell of a totalitarian world where mind control, wiretapping, weapons, harassment, and paranoia are weaving themselves into the fabric of life in the Bruderhof. They put on a wonderful front. No, oh, they have had good PR. You know, and, and there was an article in the Globe about them not so long ago. Miriam Arnold Holmes, ex-member and granddaughter of the founder, Eberhard Arnold. This is so completely 
opposite to what he had in mind. What Eberhard Arnold had in mind was the kingdom of God come to earth, a radical pacifist Christian community where everything is shared and ego and selfishness are sacrificed at the altar of the common higher good. Founded in Germany, the Bruderhof now has six U.S. communities in Connecticut, Pennsylvania, and New York. The life appears simple, but they'll tell you the way is not easy. The Bruderhof is the hardest church to join. You literally have to fight to get into it. Christoph Arnold is also a grandchild of the founder, and like his father before him, he's become leader of this community of 2,200. It's an experiment. Does this work? For us, it's no experiment. It's a commitment. For us, it means life. It means everything. If it doesn't, if it would be an experiment, I wouldn't be here. Many are not. Kit, or Keep in Touch, is a newsletter that acts as a sounding board for ex-Bruderhof members. Kit was started by Ramon Sender, a one-time Bruderhof novice who dropped out of the community and then lost touch with his daughter, who remained behind. A few years ago, Sender tried once again to contact her, only to be told she had died. Do you blame the Bruderhof for, at the end for not letting you know that she was Oh, I think it's absolutely unconscionable not to let a father know that his daughter's dying of cancer. I think it's the most horrible thing in the world. Sender's experience is shared by other ex-members who claim the Bruderhof pressures their relatives into cutting off family communications. I think we were very, very badly marked by our experience. Tension mounted this summer when the Bruderhof was accused of trying to plant a recording device at a meeting of ex-Bruderhof members. Yeah, we're out to destroy the Bruderhof. We have to destroy it as it is currently governed. Blair Purcell, whose wife grew up in the Bruderhof and hasn't seen her parents in years, says the attempted bugging of the Kingston Conference is part of a larger pattern of harassment the Bruderhof has launched against its critics. One high-ranking ex-member found a wiretap on his phone, and an 800 hotline number for ex-members was put on a phone sex advertisement. We received 1,713 calls in 22 days. Ultimately, I did receive uh, a total of three death threats. Oh, yeah. I'll be watching you. That'll give you something to write about. A trace on the calls revealed that most came from New York State, near the Bruderhof's Woodcrest community. Yeah, I got a message for you. Go f yourselves. And you believe this was all orchestrated by people at the Bruderhof? Nobody else would have any motive. <laughs> I mean, uh, that's the answer. I'm accused of, you know, brainwashing, controlling people. This time, the, uh, I had no control. They didn't listen to me. What should I do? Christoph Arnold suggests that some overzealous youngsters from the Bruderhof may have made the calls. I think some called, but they did it against my orders. And do you have any suggestions for me the next time? I don't buy that for a second. But this guy, you know what he says goes, and if you say anything against him, you are out. You know. And uh, the leaders, leadership in the Bruderhof is really into power, and the only way they can have that power is by knowing exactly what's going on. How about um, wiretapping? I, I, I didn't have anything to do with it. So, I mean, you would also like to know what's happening, wouldn't you? If, you know, people get together about your family and so on. So we all see human beings who do mistakes. Phone taps, harassing calls, electronic surveillance, odd ministries to be sure for devout Amish-like Christians. But nothing has alarmed the critics of the Bruderhof more than Christoph Arnold's application for a license to carry a concealed weapon. I would say that uh, Eberhard Arnold would be turning in his grave, almost the principle of a rotisserie. Julius Rubin, author of an upcoming book on the Bruderhof. It's just unthinkable in terms of their early history that they would have any guns at all. Hmm. It's an American right, isn't it?
Arnold says the criticism is overkill. The gun, now gone, was for rabid animals. They say that on the permit application you wrote it was for personal protection. Against, uh, against a rabid animal it is personal protection and it is the only reason the, the law enforcement people understand. So I just put it because everybody else put, puts it that way. And the concealed weapon that he chose was a 44 Magnum pistol. Uh, it's called a cannon. It's the kind of weapon that Dirty Harry used in the Clint Eastwood movies. One doesn't use a 44 caliber laser-sided weapon that you conceal on your person to shoot a rabid animal. I think that sincerely they're afraid of some type of attack from the outside. I think they really see the world in terms of enemies that are set out to destroy them. Quite a flap over that weapon, huh? There is, Peter. Uh, think back to the movie Witness uh, about mm. an Amish community. Yeah. The Bruderhof are an Amish-like pacifist group with a strong tradition of pacifism. In a community like that, for a gun to be brought in, it's unthinkable. For example, one of their codes is uh, they'll frequently ask you, what would you do if a murderer came in and tried to murder your children and your family? And the answer is you would put yourself between the attacker and your family, but you would not raise your fist against someone, even someone who intended to do you harm. Okay. When we come back, Ruderhoff family values. Coming up later, the vow of poverty, jettisoned, and next, cut off from her family, Susanna's story. I felt that if that's what God was, what they were representing, then I didn't want to have a part of it. And when did the trouble start for you in the Buddha house? Well, trouble, it's hard to say. Um, I think I realized like that I felt that I should leave or wanted to leave by the time I was like 12, I would say, because I felt that if that's what God was, what they were representing, then I didn't want to have a part of it. Susanna Zumpe always had trouble fitting into the restrictive lifestyle of the Bruderhof. She had to make public confessions to such crimes as shaving her legs or listening to Simon and Garfunkel, for example. But at the age of 12, a far more potent evil entered her life. In this sexually reactionary community where hand-holding and flirting are considered the work of the devil, Susanna claims an older male member of the Bruderhof sexually molested her in the shower. Susanna, you had he is still family. with the community, and she's now on the outside, away from the family she loves. Has justice been done there? I don't feel it has. Um, if somebody there commits a crime that is a crime in the United States of America, that they should also be treated like anybody else living here, and that they shouldn't have their own set of rules. Are you familiar with the case? A, a little bit. A little bit, but not enough. That, that happened in one of the other communities. But you, you're in charge of the community, so... Yeah, but I, I, I wasn't involved. Christoph Arnold pleads ignorance of Susanna's situation. Sort of. I think Susanna's also exaggerating it. Because I've read her letters in in Kid, and you can't believe everything she says. Susanna now lives with her brother Dieter, who left the Bruderhof ten years earlier. Their parents are still with the Bruderhof. Doesn't that hurt as yes. a daughter? Very much it does. I always thought that they would just stick up for me, but I guess I was naive. I mean, I don't think we'll ever be together as a family, and I pretty much accepted that now. Often, broken families are the result of the Bruderhof practice of church discipline, which involves various degrees of exclusion or shunning. Sometimes members are not allowed to talk to others for a few days. More serious offenders are separated from their families and sent outside the community for a longer time. We were always told that everybody on the outside is evil. Miriam Arnold Holmes was excluded for two years inside the community. No one spoke to her, no one ate with her, she was a virtual untouchable. Then one day in 1964, Miriam was put in a car and driven out of the community. And we rode off, they didn't tell me where I was going, nobody said goodbye, nobody came to the car. 
She was dropped off at a YWCA outside Pittsburgh. The Bruderhof gave her $50 to start a new life. My heart just broke for my father. I thought, my father is never going to live this one down. In the outside world, if a child doesn't listen to papa and mama, does he? Don't they sometimes say, you are out of here if you don't abide by my rules? To the Bruderhof, exclusion is simply a tool to help man get right with God. And the minute, you know, where we feel a new beginning, we welcome them with open arms. And it's not, you are gonna, we forget about you. But does the community see Satan at work in the outside world? In the outside world, yes, and in us too. Boy, Satan, he, he's a wicked guy. Man alive, he's, he's at work overtime. Tough on these family members to be separated like yes, that. Yes, and they're so separate. It's as if they live on different planets. Once uh, family members have left the community. Just last week, a young man named Andrew Baisley called to speak to his mother, who was gravely ill, and was told that his mother had in fact died. He had not been informed, and he was told in, that he would not be welcome to attend her funeral. Andrew decided to go anyway, and in fact was welcomed, and his grandparents offered him some refreshment and, and felt better for it. But uh, it's very oh. difficult. The community says they don't stand in the way, it, they just follow the person's wishes, and they will inform people if, if they're told to do so. All right. When we come back, yeah. politics, religion, and Satan, a dangerous mix. Tomorrow, a bargain hunter's guide to the outlets of Kittery, Maine. And next, breeding the Bruderhof way. The Bruderhof has several businesses. One makes toys and furniture for daycare centers, another equipment for the handicapped. Then there's the kennel, okay. where critics contend the Bruderhof is breeding attack dogs. No, no, it's not true. It's actually what it is. It's a sport. It's, it's like, the, for Germany, it's like the World Series or the uh, Super Bowl. Christoph Arnold, whose dog's name, by the way, is Kit, says the notion of attack dogs is just more noise from ex-members who have lost their way. <laughs> I feel very sorry for them, because actually, deep down, they love the community, yet they do not want to take the commitment upon themselves. And sad to say, most of them live a pretty messed up life. Jesus says you should rejoice when you are attacked. So we're actually rejoicing. You must be doing something right. Indeed. The Bruderhof spent its early years in desperate poverty. No more. I would say it's in the several hundred million dollar range. We're dealing with a, a very prosperous, wealthy, uh, powerful group. Unlike the Amish, the Bruderhof have no aversion to technology. In fact, they're into high technology. It belongs to free enterprise. I don't know if our listeners have heard of the American dream of free enterprise. And we want part of the pie also. Arnold says the Bruderhof's Gulfstream jet is chartered out as a business. He acknowledges using it for mission trips, but denies rumors that he uses it for personal vacations with his family. Some people might think because I travel to Europe, I travel to Israel, I travel to Nigeria, that I'm a very special person and I have lots of fun. It isn't that glorious as it looks. Now, how does that fit with your grandfather's philosophy? Uh, poverty. He, he believed in a vow of poverty. He would say that his flock has really gone astray. Yes, we live in good times, a lot better, and good times make bad Christians, I told you that, and, and, and we have to be careful. But I'm still proud of the jet. If the Bruderhof has taken to free enterprise, they're not so sure about other American values. Do you believe in democracy? No. I'm thankful for democracy. Democracy is better. We have, we have lived under Hitler. So democracy isn't all bad, but democracy can also be a tool of Satan. It can hide other evils. 
Satan is real to you. He is, he is no, it's he, not an idea. He is a hundred percent real. For us, there are only two powers, that's light and darkness. There's no gray in between. That tendency to see the world in terms of black and white, light and darkness, in or out, us or them, may make finding middle ground difficult. I mean, Jesus says in the end times, daughter will turn against father, brother against brother, sister against sister, children against parents, the house will be divided. And it's going to get worse before it gets better. Are there signs that the world is nearing the end times? Very much. Like all tragedies, I don't think this tragedy or this story will have a happy ending. I think it's possible that, like other groups, such as the Branch Davidians, that they could become convinced that this was the end time, that the attack made by ex-members, by sociologists, by possibly by congressional or, or governmental investigations would be the end of the world. At the same time, there are people of goodwill on both sides who want to heal the rift and talk and talk it out and hope to come to some resolution. That you would hope for. More of Chronicle after tonight's Lottery Live. Stay with us.